Good morning, everybody. Firstly, I want to just give my regrets at not, at not a, being able to be with you here physically uh, and in person. But I'm with you in spirit uh, and also want to start off by congratulating Dohain Wong Rieger and the organizers for this amazing conference that has attracted both national and international attention. I have a long history and my whole life has been involved in patients with less common illnesses. I was born in South Africa uh, and uh, very quickly as I started going to medical school at the University of Cape Town, I became interested in the exceptional patient, the patient uh, that did not occur that commonly but was seen in different population groups uh, and seemed to carry a burden for the pain and suffering of some unusual diseases. One of the first diseases I looked at and saw were patients who were much taller, patients who had a disease named by uh, my mentor, Professor Peter Biden, sclerosteosis. And when I looked at these patients and you looked at what they had and you looked at their x-rays, what you saw was they had x-rays that showed increased thickening of bone. And I wondered at that point whether this really, this what we learned from this and what increased the uh, expression of osteoblast as it looked like it was, was symmetrical bone, increased bone density, might be a clue to treating osteoporosis in the general population from rare to common. As part of that we were able to bring the DNA of some of these patients to North America and together with our colleagues in a small biotech company in Seattle uh, be able to define that this in fact was a repressor of the osteoblast, the most important mammalian repressor uh, for osteoblast function. When the break was let down uh, and where the repressor had a mutation, the osteoblast was overactive. And there, just with that recognition, we realized is there that these patients with rare disease offered a new approach to treatment of osteoporosis. This really was further developed by uh, the pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, and shown to have improvement in patients with low bone density uh, and it was called sclerostin uh, for the disease sclerosteosis. And I'm really delighted to say that just a few weeks ago this drug uh, was approved for treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis and it all originated with a rare family in South Africa uh, and that exceptional patient gave tremendous insights into uh, the opportunities for treatment of much more common diseases. The next example I want to share with you, and all this happened as a medical student in South Africa where I really was following uh, genetics and following the patients, was uh, in this particular pedigree you can see a, a child here, a mother, who noticed children did not cry when given shots or during teeth, uh, and also what, as an older child, the child had numerous abrasions and various fell, numerous burns, but never cried. And this uh, was recognized as insensitivity to pain. In fact, we started identifying other patients with congenital indifference to pain. And these were women who said childbirth was not painful, that multiple fractures, corneal abrasions, but all of this was done with no uh, experience of pain. And when I moved to Canada in the mid-80s, we also then started identifying families with congenital insensitivity to pain all throughout the country. And these were families from Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And we recognized if we understood what was really resulting in no pain in these patients, this may represent a t novel target for analgesia. This was covered also with other families in the New York Times. Uh, in 2012, where a young girl could put a hand in boiling water and feel no pain. And after that, we did identify that the cause for this was a loss of function in the NAV 1.7 uh, channel, a sodium channel in the brain. And this then became a target for new drug therapy and is still today one of the most validated targets for new drug therapy for pain. And particularly, this is a non-opioid pain uh, target which really offers much hope. And many companies are now working on the development of NAV 1.7 antagonists both small molecule and large molecule antibodies for treatment of pain. Well, in addition, in South Africa, when I finished my medical degree, I did my PhD, 
and my PhD was on Huntington disease. And I got to see the families with Huntington disease all over South Africa. I traveled to every mental hospital and identified uh, over a thousand patients, a disease that was considered to be extremely rare in South Africa, maybe didn't exist, but certainly we found many patients with this condition. But as I sat with the families, and you can see from this slide that this is a long time ago, I had hair and even a beard. And as you can see, I look a little different today. But what I was struck by was the humanity, the way these families re uh, accepted, uh, welcomed the input, and there was such a starvation for information, for knowledge, for support of multiple forms uh, 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 in terms of these families. As a result of that, in fact, I met Marjorie Guthrie. And Marjorie Guthrie helped uh, to bring me initially to the United States and then supported my move to Canada uh, in an effort to bring some uh, additional research and work to families with Huntington disease. Uh, Marjorie enrolled uh, Senator Ted Kennedy in this in an effort to get me the appropriate immigration. And because of this, I'm really in North America today. My life has been committed to doing things for families with Huntington disease. And by defining the targets for this disease, we really are uh, being able to develop new approaches to therapy, both those that knock down the mutant gene, as well as t uh, uh, small molecule drugs that are helpful in targeting particular targets that appear to be particularly hopeful for families with neurodegenerative disease. Patients with rare diseases have, has always been a fascination, and these families deserve uh, uh, appropriate care, support, information, education, and in Canada, there's much we can still do to support families with rare diseases. Important on the legislation front and the regulatory front, we need to have an, an orphan drug bill, and we need to have orphan designation to both uh, as is in Europe and in the United States, where in fact the orphan drug legislation and orphan uh, designation encourages research. And what we want is not only for the fundamental research to be done in Canada, as has been done throughout the country by so many outstanding researchers in different corners of the country, but also we want to have legislation and support for orphan drug development in Canada that will help support and give some exclusivity to orphan drugs that gives a period of exclusivity that is similar to that seen in the United States as well as in Europe. And this particular orphan uh, designation has re resulted in a plethora of new drug uh, development seen uh, in, in both the United States and, and Europe. And I would like to see this also in Canada. We need to be a nation that not only does this amazing research, but also develops a, uh, a thriving, productive biotech industry that's the developing the drugs for patients in this country uh, with rare disorders. We did this with Glybera for lipoprotein lipase, a very common disorder in certain parts of Quebec that led to the first approved gene therapy uh, for, uh, for this disorder and the first gene therapy in the world that was approved in 2012. And we're certainly hoping to continue to focus on families with rare disorders where often replacement of a gene or repair of a defective gene uh, can be really useful in improving the quality of life of these patients. What we need is the support uh, uh, federally of appropriate regulatory support that both encourages, rewards, and uh, will bring in investments so that we can do appropriate drug development in Canada in the interest of our citizens and then be able to develop a thriving biotech industry that further will bring additional support for families with rare disorders. The bottom line is, from rare disorders, we can learn so much that have influence on common disorders, from osteoporosis to pain, but also from rare disorders, these patients themselves deserve the focus, the education, the awareness, the investment to be able to bring hope where, they were, where it was hopeless and to bring light where for so many families they've been isolated and there's just been darkness. Thank you for your time.